Brown Grows Green, How to Take Back America from the Reactionaries. Ed Cowan is a writer, thinker, speaker, and patriot who has been published in Australia, Europe, and the United States. His book, Terminal Planet or Green Earth, was published in 2006 by Ex Libris. In this 2008 winter of our discontent, I'm concerned about the state of the nation and the world. I have some tremendously bad news and some profoundly good news. The bad news is first. Every second that ticks, we have four more people on Earth and one less acre of rainforest. Four more people every second to compound all other problems and to tax our dwindling resources. Lester Brown reports in Plan B 2.0 that 58 million hectares of Brazil are turning into desert. He adds, as we burn off the Amazon rainforest, we are burning one of the great repositories of genetic information. We are also burning up the lungs of the world, countless species, and dwindling numbers of mammals. The world has over 32,000 nuclear weapons in nine nations, and a dozen nations capable of nuclear arsenals. Yet thanks to Bush Cheney, there are no ongoing negotiations between the nuclear powers. American and Russian missiles are still trained on each other and on high alert. The world has over 32, uh, excuse me, over 900 billionaires worth trillions of dollars. And the economic model that produces this wealth and the elite minders who serve them is called the neoliberal economic model. The vernacular is far more accurate. The race to the bottom. Ironically, the U.S., the nation that perfected this economic model, now finds that its top import from China is computer components. Its top export to China, soybeans. That's from David C. Corton's excellent book, The Great Turning, From Empire to Earth Community. He says, the U.S. trade profile is increasingly that of a third world country that exports commodities and imports finished goods. Homelessness, poverty, and despair for the suffering half of humanity are on the rise worldwide and worse than ever in the U.S. Our oceans are filthy and depleted of edible fish, but jellyfish, red tide, and junk fish are flourishing. Our seas are also plagued with floating islands of cargo containers, plastics, and other flotsam so thick in the eddies of the major oceans that they hinder navigation. On land, temperatures are rising, and fresh water is a resource of diminishing returns. Over 3.2 billion people in 15 nations, USA is one, were living on land that was overpumping aquifers in 2005. Plan B. So far, I haven't mentioned that there are 12 environmental tripping points. The Amazon rainforest, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the Greenland ice sheet, and the methane cloth rates are four of the worst. And if just one of these points trips, the sea level will go up in feet, not inches. If we warm so much that the seven million cubic miles of ice in the West Antarctic ice sheet melts, that alone will raise the sea level 16 to 50 feet. In short, our beautiful planet is being ravished by man-made problems, and we lack a concerted effort by governments to solve these mirrored problems. In my lifetime, Earth is turning from a rich, verdant planet with billions of species into a hot, overpopulated, nude planet. Planet Doom. So what can we do about all of this? Here's what, in a nutshell. We're not using media what I call the electronic word, to its full potential. We begin to do so when we ask Bush and all national politicians in all nations my precise 127 word question about the top five problems of the planet. Bush will ignore the question as long as he's allowed to, but other heads of state and American politicians will answer it, provoking a worldwide debate. Out of that debate, the governments of the major powers will develop an agenda for solving our top problems. That'll be possible because many ideas, plans, and programs will emerge from the debate. Then, in about six years, we will solve the nuclear issue, reduce all forces worldwide to one-third of today's forces, and save trillions. 
We will have the funds to re, uh, build the renewable civilization that morphs into the sustainable civilization, or we will perish. Reduced to a thumbnail summary, that's how we bail out the earth. The problem is, none of you believe me. You're dubious, to say the least, and rightly so. For any of you could point out to me, hey, Ed, how about a reality check? Mankind has been warring against himself since the first ding-dong of time. And you're saying we're going to solve the nuclear issue, cut all forces to one-third of today's forces, and save trillions in six years? Aren't you a bit optimistic? It sounds impossible. So naturally you scoff and assume that I'm a silly idealist who's a little bit crazy on this issue. What I'm advocating sounds so outside the mythos of our day, what we believe to be possible, that you dismiss me as a crazy, a misguided idealist at best. In reality, I'm the realist, and you're the idealist. I'm like Copernicus and Galileo trying to convince you the world is round when you know it is flat. Let me show you why I'm the realist. The facts are ugly, but must be recognized. Let's start with nuclear weapons. We currently have nine nations with nuclear weapons and another three that can produce them. Are we going to have 120 to 130 different closed-door negotiations between the nuclear powers to solve the problem? Of course not. It's all been impossible. Yet no one points that out, proposes realistic solutions, or even addresses the problem. Closed-door diplomacy has its uses, but it's totally antiquated for today's world problems. Consider this point. Here's a paperclip. Before it could be made, there had to be a plan, a blueprint. The blueprints for your house run several pages, and the blueprints for an F-15 would fill your bathroom, if not your bedroom, just blueprints. Yet you can't name a single plan to solve a single top problem. Nobody can because there aren't any, except this. You don't know what the top five problems of the planet are, do you? You don't because none of our politicians ever ask that question, or rank our problems by priority. You wouldn't allow your house to be constructed without blueprints. Likewise, we will never build world peace without plans. Today, there are none, except this one. Beginning to get the picture, See why I'm the realist? Progress necessitates plans, but this is the world's only comprehensive plan to solve any of the top problems. See this cup? It's a metaphor for the planet. It's now half full of water. Water represents humanity, people. In my opinion, Earth was half full of humans in about 1500. I fill it to carrying capacity, the maximum amount of water that I can carry without spilling it. Think of it as the number of people that Earth will support while also sustaining the extremely rich flora and fauna with which we were blessed. That ideal carrying capacity probably occurred on Earth in about 1900. 1900, before my parents were born and Earth had already reached its maximum human population if we were to preserve the countless species of our richly endowed planet. We did not, and now maybe half of our species have disappeared. Folks, the reason the nuclear tipped arms race is number one, and population number two is simple. Nuclear war. Earth now half full of it. Four billion killed in the war. See why it's number one? But we haven't had a real nuclear war yet. So let's get it back to the present, which is overflowing. Is it full yet? It's only water. Out there it's a river of human semen and eggs making babies. Get the point? It doesn't matter what it is. Everything, including spaceship Earth, has a limit. That's why we can't solve our other top problems if we don't solve this one. For excessive population compounds all other problems. I ask everyone, silly idealist, sober realist, and everyone in between, does America have an off switch? 
It's a question that so boggles your mind, most of you don't even know what I mean by off. It's not a metaphor, folks. If a large nuclear weapon is fired 500 miles over Omaha, the electromagnetic pulse, EMP, will generate up to 50,000 volts per meter in all metal conductors in the 48 states, southern Canada, and northern Mexico. EMP fries all microchip technology. So nothing electronic works, including the food and fuel flows, your car, your furnace fan, your computer, your watch. Cell phones and landlines are silent. America has been permanently shut down with one large nuclear weapon. Now we arrive at the bad news. Our nuclear power plants. We should expect various degrees of meltdown at over 100 nuclear power plants online at the time. And there'd be no way to even fight these nuclear fires. America would soon be uninhabitable, yet still inhabited by 300 million desperate people. Just how dire our situation truly is? Now do you see who the realist is? I'm not suggesting that EMP is inevitable. It isn't. We can prevent it with proper steps, but only if we try, which we aren't. EMP is just one silent but very powerful general in an army of problems that are overcoming us. Yet none of these issues are ever discussed in time on today or the internet news. So, I'm the realist trying to tackle international problems in a realistic way. With all due respect, most of you are the idealists who seem to think that current efforts by politicians are going to solve them. But you're not silly idealists, I know. You simply don't know what to think about all of this. You have plenty of your own problems. I may be depressing you more. Yet we must think about these issues and act. We are all silly idealists, only if we fail to act. So now let's get to the good news. How we really can solve these problems. The message of these two esteemed gentlemen and me is that there are solutions to every man-made problem. I offer a simple but comprehensive plan to solve our top problem. And here's why the news is good. We're not using media, what I call the electronic work, of which the World Wide Web is the most vibrant part, to its full potential. We use the web very creatively, but mainly to entertain. It's time to use the web proactively to provoke an international debate about the top problems of the planet. How? It begins when the following question opens the evening news. It is addressed to the U.S. President, all heads of state, all members of Congress, and all national politicians in all nations. The question is, do you agree, Mr. President, that the top five problems of the planet are, number one, the nuclear-tipped arms race, Number one, because it is the only problem that can destroy us, with ozone coming up quickly on the outside rail. And because by solving it, we can save trillions of dollars. Two, excessive population and population growth. Three, the stagnant, self-cannibalizing, super wasteful, wholly corporate, global market economy. Four, disparity between the rich and poor within countries and disparity between countries and five the environment the master of ceremonies problem that never leaves us that we solve only in degree if you do not agree mr president what are the top five problems of the planet and where sir is your plan to solve them this question is very precise and contains exactly 127 words. And because it has been time tested over 27 years, please pass it on as is. Many will ask, where is global warming? As a problem, it is only part of problem five, the environment. But what causes global warming? The rapacious neoliberal market economy causes global warming. But the market economy is neither new nor liberal. Reduced to two words, it is human greed. We could have gone solar when we went nuclear and spiked carbon 50 years ago. We didn't because the corporate lions have lots of stock and hubris invested in nuclear and carbon. 
To solve global warming, we have to tightly leash all corporations with 10-year charters that severely restrict and even mold corporations to serve humanity. The president, or PP, the perfect puppet of the billionaires, will ignore the question. But once it makes the national news, other politicians will begin to answer the question and begin a dialogue. That dialogue will grow into a worldwide debate as other world leaders begin to answer the question. At that point, most nations, but not all, will agree to a list of our top five problems. It'll be a lot messier than I summarize, but it's what we want to do, is it not? It all begins with my 127-word question for the president and all national leaders in all nations. How do we take back our country from the corporations? I suggest we take it back with this powerful argument, a four-pronged attack against the entire current corporate structure and the greed that drives it. First, I'll quote you the wisest paragraph I know. Nothing in the Bible or the works of Shakespeare can quite equal the wisdom of these lines from Malcolm X. I've had enough of someone else's propaganda. I had written to these friends. I'm for truth, no matter who tells it. I'm for justice no matter who it is for or against. I'm a human being first and foremost, and as such, I'm for whoever and whatever benefits humanity as a whole. As a whole is in italics, his italics. To me, the most important clause in that most excellent paragraph is, I'm a human being first and foremost. Before you're black, white, or brown, you are a human being. Before you're male or female, tall or short, fat or thin, smart or stupid, straight or gay, beautiful or ugly, rich or poor, you are a human being. And in that simple fact that we are all human before we are anything else, lies our equality. Not an equality of talent. Dr. Einstein and Mr. Jordan have shown us that but an equality, a personness. It is your person that the U.S. Constitution protects. By establishing this fact, that we are all humans first and foremost, in the public mind, we are then ready to establish that we are all equal as citizens. We then unnerve the right with the second prong of our attack, that therefore, all of the public institutions of mankind are here to serve all of us. And that includes the largest of all institutions, our economic system. We must make this the new American maxim, the new creed to which we hold all corporations, that they serve we the people, not the corporate elite. Also, we must endlessly promote the statement from our only great Republican president. Labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is only the fruit of labor and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. Labor is the superior of capital and deserves much the higher consideration. Lincoln wrote those words in a written address to Congress in December 1861. His message is taken in loud and clear by liberals and progressives. But most conservatives would attribute those words to Karl Marx. This quote shows how far the Republican Party has evolved today from its founder. They are now 180 degrees out of sync with honest aid. This question brings it all into focus, folks. What is the supreme law of the land, Justice Scalia? A, the U.S. Constitution. B, NAFTA. C, the WTO. D, whatever the president thinks it is, or E, all of the above except A. The truth is, no one really knows, and Scalia would rather die than answer that question. The only way to ensure that the U.S. Constitution is again the answer to that question is to keep asking it until Congress takes a paper straighter to NAFTA and the WTO. We're talking about plain old human greed, folks. The cause of disparity, problem four. 
disparity within and between countries is directly uh, is a direct consequence of unrestricted greed and directly linked to the market economy. We want to create a sustainable, healthy, people-oriented economy to redress some of the imbalance in the U.S. Worldwide, the most successful programs are the people-to-people -people microloans that nurture and grow the local economy. Instead of the rap cases race to the bottom, we want to grow the local economy on a sustainable, organic basis worldwide. Our fourth prong completely unhinges the reactionaries with devastating gentleness. We again use media to ask Reverend Billy Graham this simple question. Was Jesus Christ a conservative or a liberal? We ask Reverend Graham because he is the president's religious mentor. And he'll probably try to come to his rescue with something like, Jesus Christ was not political, to which I would immediately respond, are you kidding, Reverend Graham? The greatest political act in history, sir, was when that semi-literate carpenter from Nazareth stood before the greatest empire this world has ever seen and said, hey, fellas, you got it all wrong. It's not might makes right. It's not the spot with the dollar sign beside your name. Always, always maximize your gain. That's not it. It's really about loving, sharing, and caring. And I hope you, Reverend Grant, and Mr. President, will join me in building a world of loving, sharing, and caring like Christ. Not a world of worrying, exploiting, and intimidating. These four concerted points driven into the consciousness of the nation, will cut and disperse the fog of hypocrisy that currently passes for discourse on TV. I'd like to expand on that, but we have an emergency, a higher priority. Our overriding problem is that Bush, the man whose fingers on the nuclear trigger, is guilty of treason on 9-11. That's right. This president decided to listen to kids read on 9-11 instead of fight back with the two F-15s that were scrambled by the first hijacking. We could have uh, saved the people in the WTC-2 in the Pentagon if Bush had responded as a patriot. He issued shoot-down authority for building mound jetliners at 10.25 a.m., well after all hijacked planes had crashed. That's because they knew of the attack ahead of time and wanted it to fully develop. Huh, you say? How do I really know that? It's easy. Just consider the facts. Bush was pulling into a school in Florida when the first tower was hit. He learned from advisor Rice at 855 that the plane was a commercial jet. Bush is sufficiently craven to simply have ignored the attack. But Carl Rove would never have let Bush enter that classroom if they didn't know where the planes were headed. What if the targets for five hijacked planes were the WTC-1, two nuclear power plants, the Capitol, and the White House? Bush has a sick look on his face on 9-11, as he should since his treason is being filmed. But for a man who could lose several Illinois-sized pieces of real estate, he's surprisingly calm. That's because thanks to the Clinton administration, Bush Cheney learned of the attack ahead of time, unbeknownst to Al-Qaeda. Don't take my word for it. Read pages 34 to 39 of the 9-11 Commission Report and watch Moore's film, Fahrenheit 9-11. You won't see on the film or the report one example of Bush Cheney fighting back against Al-Qaeda on 9-11. But you will see this man's indifference to the deaths of his fellow Americans. Bush sat on his hands and let the attack occur on 9-11. He let the attack occur, my fellow Americans, because he wanted everyone to be outraged at Al-Qaeda. An outrage we naturally wore. Look what is followed. Two wars in a third brewing. Two Patriot Acts. Countless attacks on the poor, the environment, the middle class, and endless fiscal and trade deficits. Bush chief sacrificed 3,000 people on 9-11 so we would be outraged and willing to follow these traitors down the reactionary path of war, greed, and mean value. 
And if you still doubt what I'm saying, check out this DVD, The Demolitions, which you can purchase at 911mysteries.com. It shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Twin Towers were brought down by a demolition team, not burning kerosene. So let's review. We have a multitude of very serious problems plaguing the planet. Our oceans are filthy. Our natural resources are being ravished the world over. And we have a dozen tripping points that could trigger very high water indeed. Earth is being ravished by man-made problems. And we lack a concerted effort by governments to solve these mirrored problems. And our po politicians are coping in very inexperienced and unorganized ways. There are lots of good ideas out there, but we're not organized or even trying to get organized. We're turning Earth into doom. We begin to get organized when we use media to its full potential. And we do that when we ask our president and all national leaders in all nations my precise 127 word question. That will provoke an international debate, and out of that debate we will get organized. It sounds like silly idealism. But I'm the realist tackling international problems in a realistic way. I've shown with the analogy of the cup that everything, including spaceship Earth, has a limit. In addition, we have an off switch and enormous problems with nuclear science that we ignore. For those who say global warming is number one, I remind them that it is caused by voracious capitalism, problem number three. But it is really only a part of problem five, the environment. Maintaining the moderate temperature on Earth that promoted 10,000 years of rapid human development will be a constant major part of problem five, the environment, from now on. We take back our country with a four-pronged attack on the reactionaries. One, we use the Malcolm X quote to remind all citizens of our equality. Two, therefore, all public institutions are here to serve all, not the elite. Three, we Use the Lincoln quote to show, show that labor is superior to capital. And four, we remind the reactionary right that Christ was a liberal. These four concerted points, driven into the consciousness of the nation, will disperse the fog of hypocrisy that now envelops everyone. But how do we get there, folks? We've still got Trader Bush occupying the White House and raising hell on earth. How do we bring Bush Cheney to justice? I suggest we have to impeach Bush Cheney. We do that, I think, when we posterize Bush's treason on 9-11. Since Bush Cheney are exiting, we need special legislation, which you can view at edcowan.ws, that will appoint Al Gore to the presidency he won in 2000 to serve out his second term. That special legislation will make Gore ineligible to run in 2008, but not 2012. I'd now like to ask Al the most important question he'll ever answer. He won't hear me, of course, unless you go to edcowan.ws, E-D-C-O-W-A-N.ws, and click on top five question. When you click on 9-11 treason, you will get Bush's mugshot on 9-11, and my follow-up question for Congress to print on the back. Please print five copies of both sides and the top five questions and pass them on to five other patrons. Thank you all for coming and thank you. And if you want to save America, help posterize Bush on 9-11.